I think of it as a ghost story, essentially, and it kind of follows a lot of the conventions of that genre. It is a story about the past and how it affects the present. It's a story about uh, people who are drawn back into history and who, who won't be, who can't escape history. My name's Hari Kunzru. The name of my new book is White Tears, and it's the story of two young New York record producers who fake a 1920s blues record. It's interesting writing about sound. I think it's, I think I, I hear languages I write a lot. Um, I've always, I've always kind of heard voices in, in, in a particular sense of hearing voices. Um, but it is, it's interesting to try and find the language to describe sound precisely, and actually it's harder to do than, than, than one would think. I mean, I, I think like a lot of writers, I'm, I, I was happier with, with visual language. Um, and so I had to really kind of examine my own responses to things and really kind of practice saying, well, what do I hear? What is the word for, for that? I started listening to that kind of old blues and, and folk and country music about 10 years ago. I mean, there, there's a gateway drug that I think is the same gateway drug for a lot of people and has been the same for many years, which is a, something called Harry Smith's Anthology of American Folk Music. And Harry Smith was a Greenwich Village bohemian in the 50s who was an, uh, who was an artist and a, a collector. And he collected all sorts of things from you know, textiles to uh, paper aeroplanes, you know, he was a kind of compulsive collector, but one of the things he collected was 78 records at a time when very few people were interested in, in those things. Um, and he persuaded a guy called Moses Ash, who had a label called Folkways Records, to allow him to, to release, I think it was three uh, LPs of, uh, of his collection. And he wrote liner notes for it that are strange, kind of cosmic liner notes where filled with diagrams and uh, kind of making a case that there is a sort of occult undercurrent to American culture. There are things that you can only understand by listening to this music. And, and Harry Smith's anthology became the, um, the sort of, it circulated around all the folk fans in Greenwich Village in the, at that time, and people like Bob Dylan and Joan Byers. Um, uh, picked, you know, Dave Van Ronk, all these people who became the kind of drivers of the folk revival picked up this record and people started to play the songs and cover the songs and perform them and they dug out some of the, the blues musicians who played on them, you know, people, they found out certain people were still alive. But anyway, this was reissued and I, you know, I got hold of, I got hold of this and started listening, you know, and the light bulb went on in my head and, uh, and I found myself getting deeper and deeper and more interested in trying to trace different kinds of things through this music. And one thing you find out is that there is an extraordinary social history that you can glean from blues lyrics, because a lot of them are about work and they're about personal relationships. And you understand a lot of things about what it was like to be poor and in the South. You know, country and folk music as well as blues, you know, and there's more crossovers between the white and the black than, than people tend to understand. So. At a certain point, I was really like, what, I need to do something with this obsession of mine and, and this kind of slightly eccentric obsession because I have no necessary connection to it. And started to think about a book and then the book gave me an excuse to go further and eventually I, I managed to hook up with some really serious collectors and, and to start exploring the culture around collecting the records. Charlie Shaw is a figure in the book who may or may not exist. You know, he may be a, a projection of the narrator's imagination or he may be a real presence from the past who's trying to force his way back in a kind of ghostly way into the future. And this is a book about absence. This is a book about why certain black musicians are not present with us, you know, how, why they weren't recorded, why they weren't recognised, why, um, why they disappeared. And you know, inevitably history is very partial and, you know, our sense of, of, of you know, who is famous and important is often completely by chance. If you look at how these recordings happened in the 20s and 30s, they were, 
there were some very strange processes by which people got onto record. I mean, the, the, the most important, or one of the most important labels, which was recording this country blues music, was actually owned by a furniture company in Wisconsin. And what they wanted to do was just to sell people gramophones. And they put records out because they're, it meant that their local rep in whatever state and whatever place could go and say, well, we've got some records that might be the kind of thing that you would like to listen to. So, you know, if you're in West Texas, they'll sell you some cowboy songs. If, you, if you're, you know, in, in, uh, in the mountains in West Virginia, they'll sell you some, you know, fiddle breakdowns and they'll sell you Cajun music down in Louisiana. And in, in Mississippi and Tennessee and black communities there, they, they needed some some local black music to, to sell to their customers, you know, to persuade them to buy this p big piece of furniture, you know, this kind of thing that you would buy on in, in installments. And so um, people got recorded without any reference to the tastemakers in New York, and they were recorded in a very throwaway sort of way. I mean, often people would, would audition for a record store owner, be given a train ticket to Grafton, Wisconsin, and 10 bucks, go play in the room above the furniture factory, go away, never even see the record, let alone be part of promotion or feel that they had a career. So these things are completely ephemeral a lot of the time. And a lot of the musicians were not people who had, who had, who left much other trace. You know, a lot of scholars have looked for some of very important musicians and found almost nothing about them. These, these are, they are like ghosts at the edges of American consciousness, and, and some of them are extraordinarily brilliant and are and have had a legacy in things like rock and roll music. You know, they're part of mainstream global culture, but we almost don't. You know, they almost vanished, and that kind of fragility was really interesting to me about you know who gets remembered and who who gets forgotten. You know, who got the thumbs up that day playing on the porch for. Uh, H.P. Spear, the record store owner in Jackson, and, you know, and who did he say no to who might have been just as good. For me, moving to the U.S. involved confronting the history of the place that I was living in and that I had chosen to, to be in. And, you know, I arrived just before the election of Barack Obama, and I have been there through the kind of, uh, the moment of false hope from certain liberals for a post-racial America, the idea that we could finally forget all this stuff and just consign it to history and that everybody would be happy. And then the realization actually that, that, um, that this history still poisons public life in the US to an unbelievable degree. I mean, I was quite shocked about that. I thought I knew, but I didn't know. I wanted to deal with this. I wanted to bring my own experience because I am an outsider, but I have a particular history with those questions here. My history is all about empire and, and dealing with, with that kind of th thing. So I'm aware, I'm, very, I'm a sort of attuned and alive to these questions, but was seeing them as an outsider in the States. And so I, I wanted to write about this and bring my perspective to it. There was a moment when everybody was sort of dressed as if they were 19th century gold prospectors or, or, or cowboys. You know, everybody had kind of collarless shirts and, and, and braces and sort of floppy hats and so on. And, uh, and this kind of relationship to a sort of romanticized idea of American history was very big in the hipster culture. I mean, it still is. You know, there's a, there is a shop selling artisanal axes uh, near where I live. And, you know, and everybody kind of behaves as if they're, you know, imminently off to build a cabin rather than just, you know, go and drink cocktails. Um, so there's a certain satirical element to, to that. But also, it's a story about wealth and inheritance and inherited money and what rich, you know, often rich young people whose parents have done whatever, whose family have done whatever to make the money come to New York in order to convert capital into cultural capital. You know, they go to art school, they, you know, they do an MFA, they uh, write novels, uh, you know, whatever. And um, I'm interested in the process by which that kind of hipsterdom is potentiated by um, things that it would repudiate or, or deny. You know, I mean, your average Williamsburg hipster is a social liberal who feels that they're not racist and that they have little or no connection to the uh, abuses of, of, uh, of uh, the exploitation in, in the past. But 
one of the jobs I'm doing in this book is to try and say how this long history actually determines us in the present day, and you know, and not and not to just assign blame. This isn't, you know, this isn't really about that in a way. It's it's. I'm just interested to to see how these big structural forces really determine everybody, whether you feel directly connected or or not. I think it's true that you know Seth is the one who feels most deeply. I mean, it's the whole book is through his consciousness and he does feel guilty. And I'm uh, in a sort of way, I mean, you could read the book as, uh, as being a book about a young man who's so guilty that he's driven mad. Um, and my question or one of my questions is, is it really about your personal guilt or innocence? You know, I mean, I think a l too many people filter all these questions of, of uh, race and racism through the wish not to be guilty, to, be, to find a way of, 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 of uh, you know, atoning or not feeling bad or, or for just somehow sidestepping a kind of you know, responsibility that they'd like to put on someone else. I mean, you only have to have, you know, spend 10 minutes on the internet after any... Um, police shooting in the, in the US to kind of see all these positions kind of being being worked out you know and conversely there's a lot of people let's say on the you know the young outright people these days who are very angry about being made to feel guilty that's what they feel is happening to them that they're being forced to feel guilty about something that they don't feel responsibility for and actually what i want to say is that these things are kind of structural things and personal guilt or innocence is rather beside the point. It's not about you feeling good or bad as a nice liberal or about you feeling angry as a, as a person of the right who doesn't feel that they bear any personal responsibility for uh, things that happened a hundred years ago. I think you have to recognize that, that these relations of power are very deeply embedded into structures that we all inhabit. and. Um, that the only kind of, I mean, it's why novels are good. I mean, novels are really, really good at dealing with these kind of complex social questions, much better than movies where everything has to be personalized and has to be kind of, you know, two guys talking in a, in a room. I mean, novels can show you how structures work and how systems work and how individual lives are lived through systems. And, and that's why, you know, I think a novel is a, is a good and quite subtle way of, 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 kind of, of dealing with these sort of questions.